Hi, and welcome to today's video. Today, well, we're going to be doing part one of a two-part series uh, on surface grinding. There are two main reasons for grinding. The first is hardness, when the part is just too hard to be cut with traditional cutting tools. And the second is precision, because some parts require a high degree of precision that traditional cutting tools just can't give us. It's important to know that grinding wheels don't rub material off. Grinding wheels are cutting tools. They are made up of thousands upon thousands of very small ceramic grains that are each very sharp. Each one of those grains acts as a cutting tool and will lift a chip. Since each one of those ceramic grains is very heat resistant, well we can cut at a very high temperature and thusly remove minute chips even on very hard materials. Now since we can remove very minute amounts of material, well we can cut very very accurately. If I can form a chip that's only two ten thousandths of an inch thick, well I can take a cut that's only two ten thousandths of an inch thick and I can do it accurately. I don't know if you remember but we saw in our chip speeds and feeds video that there is a lower limit to how much material you can take off of a part. Taking a smaller or thinner or less deep cut is not necessarily a good thing. At one point it's going to stop cutting and it's going to start rubbing. Let's take a look at well, carbide tools. We can have roughing carbide tools or finishing carbide tools. The roughing carbide tools actually have a radius along their cutting lip, cutting edge, sorry. And well, to work properly, a roughing tool has to take a big cut. If you take a light cut, it won't lift the chip. It's just going to burnish that surface, create a lot of heat and a really, really poor surface finish. So that's no good, but if we use a finishing carbide tool, well, it's going to be a lot sharper and we'll be able to lift a much thinner chip. If we look at high-speed steel tools, well, I can make them quite sharp. So yes, I could lift a very thin chip, so, so they are accurate tools, but they are limited in their scope because they can't really cut hard materials. And that's where the grinding wheels come into. It's the best of both worlds, really. They are very, very sharp. Those grains are very sharp. And, well, they're very heat resistant. So they can cut very hard materials. And if, let's say, we wanted to go more accurate. Well, we could. It's called honing, lapping, uh, polishing. These operations can make a part even more accurate. But really, grinding as far as general work in a shop, is pretty well the most accurate way to produce parts. Mainly because how precise a machine operation is, is defined by the thickness of the thinnest chip that we can produce. Now, for this video, I'm going to need an example. And while I'm using some footage from an older video, the 123 block project that I did years ago, and I'm going to use that as an example to show how to square up and grind accurately a block. We start by cleaning up one of the primary surfaces using an old broken grinding wheel or similar coarse abrasive. What we want to do here is remove all of the scale that has formed on the surface during the heat treatment. The objective here isn't to get the surface perfectly clean, but really just to remove all that scale. Since we want the surface that we identified with the number punches to be our reference surface, so the first one to be ground, we're going to clean up the surface that has the counterbores. We can then move on to our roughing lapping plate and using a medium sized abrasive grit, get the surface nice and flat. Notice that I'm using a figure eight movement as much as possible and that I'm also trying to use as much of the lapping plate surface as possible. 
Remember, all we have to do here is clean up the primary surface that has the counter bores. Don't waste your time cleaning the other ones, because all we need here is one good surface to sit up against the surface grinder's magnetic table. Because our first grinding operation will be on the primary surface that has our numbers punched onto it. And that will become the reference surface for all the rest of the block. With everything really clean, that means the part and the surface plate, we can move on to verifying the flatness of the surface that we've just cleaned up. While applying a good pressure on the center of the block, tap the four corners. If three of the four corners don't produce any sound, you can lightly burnish the part and visually see if you have a good spread on your contact points. Now, that's the second time today that I've mentioned burnishing, and we saw what burnishing is in our benchwork videos. But just to bring it into mind again, burnishing is using a highly polished and very hard tool of some sort to rub against a part, polishing it. In other words, we're transferring the finish. And in this case, I'm using the surface plate, and I just rub very lightly on that surface plate. It's not a machining operation here. I'm not lapping it. I just want to burnish it, so I rub very, very lightly. And then I can see, when I turn it around, I can easily see where those contact points are, because they're shiny compared to the rest of the surface. And I want to see three contact points that are well spaced out here. And that'll mean that my part, when I put it on the magnetic table, is going to be nice and stable. And now using a single point diamond dressing tool, I can start to prepare my grinding wheel. The 15 degrees inclined diamond dresser should be installed about half an inch off center in the direction of rotation of the grinding wheel. Make certain that the table's longitudinal axis is locked and that the magnetic table is activated. You can then lower the grinding wheel so that it just brushes up against the diamond dresser. And now using the transverse axis, you can take a cut along the face of the grinding wheel. Take as many cuts as required to true up the wheel, but be careful, very small cuts. One hundredth of a millimeter or a couple of thousandths of an inch at a time, max. Also avoid feeding too slowly. You want your grinding wheel to have some bite to it. Once the dressing is complete, we can turn off the machine, activate the emergency stop button, and wait. Wait. Wait, we always wait for the grinding wheel to stop turning completely before we disactivate the magnetic table and remove the tool. Your hands should never come close to a turning grinding wheel. Never, never, never. Now, the main reason for that 50 degree inclination on the diamond dresser and also the main reason for offsetting it at least half an inch in the direction of rotation of the wheel is so that the diamond dresser doesn't go through the grinding wheel should the grinding wheel grab it. So think about it. If it's leaning in the direction of rotation and it's past the center of the wheel, if it does grab, well, that diamond is free to go. It won't have to go through the wheel and it could save a very nasty accident. I can't stress enough how important cleanliness is for grinding. So make certain everything is really clean. Now we can install our part with our counterboard primary surface, the one we prepared, on the magnetic table. And its secondary surfaces inclined to about 30 degrees comparatively to the longitudinal axis of the machine. We can now turn on the grinding machine and slowly bring the grinding wheel close to the surface of the part that we want to grind. Make sure that the part is moving longitudinally to ensure that you touch the lowest part of the grinding wheel. So why am I mounting the part on the magnetic table at 30 degrees? There's two reasons. And the first is appearance of the finished part. Now there's going to be machining marks on the surface that I'm going to produce here. It's a machining operation. And if they aren't perfectly aligned with the part, it really throws the customer off because it looks like the part is crooked. If those lines are made parallel, they have to be very parallel. 
there's natural angles that our eyes are trained to see and we're talking about zero degrees so parallel we're talking about 45 degrees and 90 degrees these things our eyes catch easily 30 degrees around well that's hard to see and it doesn't distract the person from the sense of precision that they'll get when they look at the part that you've just produced. So that's one reason for putting it at 30 degrees. The other reason is for safety. Now I'm going to be lowering that wheel or on some machines raising the table to just barely touch off to know where I'm starting from. And well obviously if I'm completely over the part, full width of wheel, and I come down and I do a little, oops, I go a little too far. Well, that little corner that I'm going to touch, if I'm at 30 degrees, well, that makes it uh, a lot less crunchy, let's say. So that's really the second reason for offsetting the part at 30 degrees. Once that I've just barely touched the part, I'll set the graduated collar on my depth axis to zero, and that'll be where I'll start counting. Since I don't know if I've touched the part on its lowest or highest surface, I'm going to complete this first pass without any additional depth of cut. I have, at best, only about 0.2 millimeters to take off of this first surface, and that's not very much. Note, and this is important, that if you want your grinding wheel to survive long enough to make it to the other edge of the part, you want a rapid longitudinal feed and a very slow cross feed. A slow cross feed reduces the width of each pass, and that will extend the dressed life of your grinding wheel. It's also important that the dressing wheel exits the surface of the part at each end of a pass. When the cut is complete, we can return to the back of the part without passing over the surface we've just ground. We don't want to produce marks. Now, I mentioned there that I don't have a lot of material to take off this first primary surface. And that's because of the stock that I'm starting with. Now, a good designer will always try to design so that the part can be made from stock dimensions uh, without wasting almost any material. In this case, we bought stock that measures 1 inch by 2 inch by 12 feet or something like that long that we cut into the 3 inch lengths. But actually when we cut it, we cut it longer than 3 inches because maybe the saw cut will be a little crooked and also I need a lot of material to finish those third surfaces, the tertiary surfaces. The primaries here are usually the ones that I want to start with. And this first surface that I'm cutting, well, is becoming the reference surface for everything else. So even when I do my secondary and tertiary, I'm going to be using that reference surface up against the angle plate. You'll see that in a few minutes. But I think it's important to note here that this project is being made metric. So in millimeters. And the block is actually going to measure 25 by 50 by 75. So my imperial stock will be just a little oversized. Uh, a few thousandths of an inch or about eight thousandths of an inch per side, something like that uh, for the one inch dimension and twice that for the two inch and a little more than that for the uh, three inch. And the three inch I'm going to leave more because I can cut it at the length that I want. And that's important here. That's why I'm being so careful. These large primary surfaces are the ones that I have the least material to take off from. And that's why I'm starting on them also. It's not just because they're the reference surface. So I'll take a minimum amount off of there and all they have to be is parallel one to the other. Whereas the other secondary, uh, well, I'm going to have to have a little more material on because finishing those will incorporate any error that was on the primary to secondary surfaces. And when I cut the tertiary surfaces, I'm going to have even more error to cope with. So I'm going to have to take more off to square things up, possibly, because I'll have the accumulated error from the primary to secondary surface and from the secondary to the tertiary surface. If your surface hasn't cleaned up because this pass was very light, well, you can take a second pass, but be careful. 
two thousandths of an inch in depth maximum. Now, I make a case here and there in this video about depth of cuts of around two thousandths of an inch. And well, if you're a machinist or used to using a grinder, a surface grinder, you're probably saying to yourself, well, why 2,000? You can cut way more than that. And well, I agree. But you have to remember that the 123 block project video that I'm using here as an example was produced years and years ago when I never imagined that someone other than my students and myself would ever see it. I, I didn't even know probably that YouTube existed. So that is why the 2000. That may not make sense, but think of this. I have 20 students in my shop class. They are all beginners. They have never worked on a surface grinder before. This is the first project that they're attempting that requires the use of the surface grinder. I do not want them to push the machine in any way because it increases the risk or the possibility of a crunch and an accident. You got to think also that the machine that you see in the video is a manual machine. There's no hydraulic reciprocating movement on this grinder and the cross feed is manual. And that well means that you can't push as much because the machine isn't that accurate as far as the movement goes. One cut could be a lot wider than the one before depending on how you turn the hand wheel. So that's another reason. And well another reason why these machines are quite delicate. I mean, they are lightweight manual machines. They're not very powerful. Then we're using a 10 inch diameter, half inch wide aluminum oxide wheel here. You cannot push this machine very hard. So that is why I make a case for two thousandths of an inch. But if you have a stiffer, more powerful machine, and if you have some experience in grinding, well, go for it. You can push a lot harder than that. Well, we're getting close to the end of my attention span, so I think we'll call it a day. In our next video, we'll be looking at, well, grinding operations proper and how to use them to square up a block. So, until then, have fun. Be safe. It's very important. And happy machining.